I would like to give you a fair warning of what to expect, or rather, of what not to expect from me. I find that I have made a slip in the very title of my first lecture. The title is, if I am not mistaken, The Riddle of Poetry. And the stress, of course, is on the first word, the word riddle, so that you may think that the riddle is all important, or what might still be worse, you may think that I have deluded myself into believing that I have somehow discovered the true reading of the riddle. The truth is that I have no revelations to offer. I have spent my life reading, analyzing, writing, or trying my, ha my hand at writing, and enjoying. This is the most important thing of all, drinking in poetry, and I have come to no final conclusion about it. Indeed, every time I am faced with a blank page, I feel that I have to rediscover literature for myself, that the past is of no avail, whatever, to me. So, as I have said, I have only my perplexities to offer you. I am nearing 70. I have given the major part of my life to literature, and I can only offer you doubts. The great English writer and dreamer, Thomas de Quincey, wrote in some of the thousands of pages of his 14 volumes that to discover a new problem was quite as important as to discovering the solution of an old one. But I cannot even offer you that. I can only offer you time-honored perplexities. And yet, why need I worry about that? What is a history of philosophy but a history of the perplexities of the Hindus, of the Chinese, of the Greeks, of the schoolmen, of Bishop Barclay, of Hume, of Schopenhauer, and so on. I merely wish to share those perplexities with you. I have dipped into books of aesthetics, but I had an uncomfortable feeling that I was reading the works of astronomers who had never looked at the stars. I mean that they were writing about poetry as if poetry were a task and not as it really is, a passion and a joy. For example, I have read with great respect Benedetto Croce's book on aesthetics, and I have been handed the definition that poetry and language are an expression. Now, if we think of an expression of something, then we are landed back into the old problem of form and matter, and if we think about the expression of nothing in particular, that gives us really nothing. So that we receive respectfully that definition, and then we go on to something else. We go on to poetry. We go on to life. And life is, I am sure, made of poetry. Poetry is not alien. Poetry is, as we shall see, lurking around the corner. It may spring on us at any 
at any at the moment. Now, we are apt to fall into a common confusion. We think, for example, that if we study Homer or the Divine Comedy or Fray Luis de Leon or Macbeth, we are studying poetry. But books are only occasions for the poetry. I think Emerson wrote somewhere that a library is a kind of magic cabinet. It is full of dead men, for those dead men can be brought, can be reborn, can be brought into life when you open their pages. I spoke a few minutes ago of Bishop Barclay. Barclay, who may remind you, was a prophet of the greatness of America. And Barclay wrote that the taste of the apple is neither in the apple itself, the apple cannot taste itself, nor in the mouth of the eater. It requires a contact between them. And the same thing happens to a book or to a collection of books, to a library. What is a book in itself? A book is a physical object in a world of physical objects. It is a set of dead symbols. And then the reader, the right reader, comes along and the words, or rather the poetry behind the words, for the words themselves are mere symbols, spring into life. And we have a resurrection of the world. And I am reminded now of a poem that you all know by heart. And perhaps you may never have noticed how strange it is. For perfect things in poetry do not seem strange. They seem inevitable. And so we hardly thank the writer for his pains. I am thinking of a sonnet written more than a hundred years ago by a young man in London, in Hampstead, I think, a young man who died of lung disease, of John Keats, and of his famous and perhaps hackneyed sonnet on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Now, what is strange about that poem, and I only thought about it three or four days ago when I was pondering over my lecture, is the fact that it is a poem written on the poetic experience itself. You know it by heart, and yet I would like you to hear once more the surge and thunder of its lines, of its final lines. Then felt I, like some watcher of the skies, when a new planet swims into his ken, or like stout Cortes, when with eager eyes he stared on the Pacific, and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise, silent upon a peak in Darien. So here we have the poetic experience itself. We have Chapman, George Chapman, the friend and rival of Shakespeare, being dead and suddenly coming into life. Suddenly coming back into life when John Keats read his Iliads or his Odysseys. I think it was of George Chapman, but I am not a Shakespearean scholar, that Shakespeare was thinking 
when he wrote, was it the proud full sail of his great verse, bound for the prize of all too precious you? And there is a word that seems to me very important, and the word is on first looking into Chapman's Homer. Because this first may, I think, prove most helpful to us. At the very moment when I was going over those mighty lines of Chapman, I was thinking that perhaps I was only being loyal to my memory. Perhaps the real thrill I got out of the verses of Keats lay in that distant moment of my childhood in Buenos Aires when I first heard my father reading them up aloud and when the fact that poetry, that language, was not only a medium for communication but could also be a passion and a joy was revealed to me. I do not think I understood the words, but I felt that something was happening to me, was happening not to my mere intelligence, but to my whole being, to my flesh and blood. And now, let's go back to the words on first looking into Chapman's Homer. I wonder if John Keats felt that thrill when he had gone through the many books of the Iliads and the Odysseys. I think the first reading of a poem is a true one. And after that, we delude ourselves into the belief that the sensation, that the impression is repeated. But as I say, it, it may be a mere loyalty, a mere trick of the memory, a mere confusion between our passion and the passion we once felt. Thus, it might be said that poetry is a new experience every time. Every time I read a poem, the experience occurs or happens to occur, and that is poetry. I read once that the American painter Whistler was in a cafe in Paris and people were discussing the influence of heredity, of the environment, of the political state of the times, and so on, on the artist. And then Whistler said, art happens. That is to say, there is something mysterious about art. And I would like to take his words, but to take them in a new sense. I should say, art happens every time we read a poem. And this may help us to clear away, I hope I am mistaken here, the time-honored notion of the classics, the idea of everlasting books, of books for one may always find beauty. Perhaps I may give a brief survey of the history of books. As far as I remember, the Greeks had no use for books or no great use for them. It is a fact, indeed, that most of the great teachers of mankind have been not writers, but speakers. Let us think of Pythagoras, of Christ, of Socrates, of the Buddha, and so on. And since I have spoken of the Socrates, I would like to say something about Plato. I remember Bernard Shaw said that Plato was the dramatist who invented Socrates. 
even as the four evangelists were the dramatists who invented Jesus. This may be going too far, but there is a certain truth in it. In one of the dialogues of Plato, he speaks about books in a rather disparaging way. And he says, what is a book? A book seems like a picture to be a living being. And yet, if we ask it something, it does not answer. And then we see it is dead. And in order to make the book into a living thing, he invented, happily for us, the Platonic dialogue. The dialogue that forestalls the reader's doubts and it questions. But we might say also that Plato was wistful about Socrates, that after Socrates' death, he would say to himself, now, what would Socrates have said about this particular doubt of mine? And then, in order to hear once again the voice of the master he loved, he wrote the dialogues. In some of these dialogues, Socrates stands for the truth. In others, Plato has dramatized his many moods, and some of those dialogues come to no conclusion, whatever, because Plato was thinking as he wrote them. He did not know the last page when he wrote the first. He was letting his mind wander, and he was dramatizing that mind into many people. But I suppose his chief aim was the illusion that despite the fact that Socrates had drunk the hemlock, Socrates was still with him. I feel that to be true, because I have had many masters in my life. I am proud of being a disciple, a good disciple, I hope. And when I think of my father, when I think of the great Jewish Spanish author, Rafael Cancinos, a sense. When I think of Macedonio Fernandez, I would also like to hear their voices. And sometimes I train my voice into the trick of imitating their voices in order that I may think as they would have thought. They are always about me. There is another sentence of one of the fathers of the church. He said that it was as dangerous to put a book into the hands of an ignorant man as to put a sword into the hands of children. So that books to the ancients were mere makeshifts. In one of his many letters, Seneca wrote against large libraries, and Schopenhauer wrote long afterwards that many people mistook the buying of a book for the buying of the contents of the book. Sometimes, looking at the many books they have at home, I feel I shall die before I have come to the end of them, and yet I cannot resist the temptation of buying new books. <laughs> when I go, when I walk, Inside the library, I find a book on one of my hobbies, for example, Old English or Old Norse poetry, and then I say to myself, what a pity I can't buy that, that book because I already have a copy at home. <laughs> and then, after the ancients, there came from the East a different idea of a book. There came the idea of Holy Writ, of books written by the Holy Ghost. There came Korans, Bibles, and so on. And following the example of Spengler in his Untergang, 
the southern landes in his decline of the West, I shall take the Koran as an example. For, if I am not mistaken, the Muslim theologians think of the Koran as being prior to the creation of the world. The Koran is written in Arabic, but the Muslims think of it as being prior to the language. Indeed, I have read that they think of the Koran not as a work of God, but as an attribute of God, even as his justice or his mercy or his all wisdom are. And thus there came into Europe the idea of holy writ. And this idea is, I think, a not wholly mistaken one. Bernard Shaw, and I am always going back to Bernard Shaw, was asked once whether he really thought that the Bible was the work of the Holy Ghost. And he said, I think the Holy Ghost has written not only the Bible, but all books. This is rather hard on the Holy Ghost, of course, <laughs> but all books worth rereading, I suppose. And this, I think, is what Homer meant when he spoke to the muse. And this is what the Hebrews and what Milton meant when they talked of the Holy Ghost, whose temple is uh, the upright and pure heart of men. And in our less beautiful mythology, we speak of the subliminal self, of the subconscious. Of course, those words are rather uncouth if we compare them with the muses or with the Holy Ghost, but still we have to put up with the mythology of our time. For the world <laughs> means essentially the same thing. Now, we come to the notion of the classics. But I think that a book is really not an immortal object to be picked up and duly worshipped, but rather an occasion for beauty. And it has to be so, for language is shifting all the time. I am very fond of etymologies, and I may give you, I may recall to you rather, for I'm sure you know much more about these things than I do, some rather curious etymologies. For example, we have in English the verb to tease. That word is a mischievous word. It means kind of joke. And yet in Old English, tezan meant to wound with a sword. Even as in French, navré meant to thrust a sword through somebody. Well, let us take a different word, the word threat. Well, in Old English, as you may find out from the very first verses of Beowulf, a threat, a threat, meant an angry crowd. That is to say, the cause of the threat. And thus, we might go on endlessly. But now, let us consider some particular verses. And I take my examples from the English since I have a particular love for the English literature, though my knowledge is of course limited. There are cases where poetry creates itself. For example, I don't think that the words creators and bodkin are especially beautiful. Indeed, I should say they were rather uncouth. But 
if we think of when he himself might his creators make with a bare bodkin, we are reminded of the great speech of Hamlet. And thus the context creates poetry for those words, those words that no one would ever dare to use nowadays because they would be mere quotations. And then there are other examples and perhaps simpler ones. Let us take the title of one of the most famous books in the world, Historia del Ingenioso Hidalgo, Don Quixote, or Don Quixote, as I suppose Cervantes was pronounced it, de la Mancha. Now, the word Hidalgo has today a peculiar dignity, all its own, and yet when Cervantes wrote it, the word Hidalgo meant, I suppose, a country, gentleman. As to the name Quixote, it was meant to be a rather ridiculous word, as the names of many of the characters in Dickens, names such as Pickwick and Swiveller and Chuzzlewit and Twist and it is so and Squeers and Quilp and so on. And then you have De La Mancha. Now this sounds noble and Castilian to us, but when Cervantes wrote it down, he intended the word to sound, perhaps, I ask the apology of any citizen of that city who may be here, as if he wrote Don Quixote of Kansas City. <laughs> and yet, nowadays, I'm not speaking against Kansas. <laughs> Let us say, Pehuajó or Buenos Aires. <laughs> and yet, you see how those words have changed, how they have been ennobled. You see the strange fact that because the old soldier, Miguel de Cervantes, poked mild fun at La Mancha, now La Mancha is one of the everlasting words of literature. And let us take another example of verses that have changed. I am thinking of a sonnet of Rossetti, a sonnet that, that labors under the not too beautiful name inclusiveness. But the sonnet begins thus, what man has bent o'er his son's sleep to brood, how that face shall watch his when cold it lies, or thought as his own mother kissed his eyes of what her kiss was when his father would. Now I think that those verses are more vivid perhaps than when they were written some 80 years ago because the cinema has taught us to follow quick sequences of visual images. And thus we have in the first line what man has bent were his son's sleep to brood? There we have the father bending over the face of the sleeping son. And then in the second image, as in a good film, we have the same images reversed. We see the, the son bending over the face of that dead man his father. And perhaps our recent study of psychology has made us more sensitive to those verses, or thought as his own mother kissed his eyes of what her kiss was when his father would. There is, of course, the beauty of the soft English vowels, brood, wood, and the additional beauty of wood being by itself, not wood her, but simply wood by itself. The word goes on ringing. Here we have one example. And there is also a different kind of beauty. 
let us take an adjective that once was commonplace. I have no Greek, but I think that the Greek is oinopa pontos, and the common English rendering is the wine dark sea. I suppose the word dark is slipped in to make things easier for the reader. Perhaps it would be the wine is sea or something of the kind. But I am sure that when Homer, or when the many Greeks we call Homer, wrote it, they were simply thinking of the sea. I mean, the adjective was straightforward. But nowadays, after trying many fancy adjectives, if I, or if any of you, write in a poem, the wine dark sea, this is not a mere repetition of what the Greeks wrote. It is rather a going back to tradition. It means rather that when we speak of the wine dark sea, we are thinking of Homer and of the many centuries, perhaps the 30 centuries between us and Homer. So that though the words may be much the same, when we write the wine dark sea, we're really writing something quite different from what Homer was writing. So that thus the language is shifting. The Latins knew all about that. And the reader is shifting also. And this brings us back to the old metaphor of the Greek. The metaphor, or rather the truth about no man going down twice to the same river. And there is, I think, an element of fear here. Because at first we are apt to think of the river as flowing. We think, well, of course, the river goes on, but the water is changing. And then, with a beginning sense of awe, we feel that we also are changing, that we are a shifting and as evanescent as the river is. But we need not worry too much about the fate of the classics, because beauty is always with us. And here I would like to quote another verse, perhaps by a now forgotten poet, Browning. He says, just when we are safest, there's a sunset touch, a chorus ending from Euripides, somebody's death. But the first verse is enough. Just when we are safest. That is to say, beauty is lurking all about us. It may come to us in the name of a film. It may, came, it may come to us in some popular lyric. We may even find it in the pages of a great and famous writer. And since I have spoken of a dead master of mine, Rafael Cancino Sassens, maybe this is the second time you hear his name. I don't, I don't quite know why he's forgotten. I remember that Cancino Sassens wrote a very fine prose poem wherein he asked God to defend him, to save him from beauty, because he says there is too much beauty in the world. And he thought that beauty was overwhelming it. And though I do not know if I have been a particularly happy man, but I hope I'm going to be happy at the right age, at the ripe age of 67, I still think that beauty is all around us. And as to the fact of a poem being written by a great poet or not, this is only important 
to historians of literature. Let us suppose, for the sake of argument, that I have written a beautiful land. Let us take this as a working hypothesis. Once I have written it, that land does me no good, because, as I already said, that line came to me from the Holy Ghost, from the subliminal self, or perhaps, as I often find out, I'm merely quoting something I read some time ago. <laughs> and then, after rediscovering. So that perhaps it is better that a poet should be nameless. I spoke about the wine dark sea, and now, as my hobby is old English, and I'm afraid if you have the courage or the patience to come back to some of my lectures, you may have more Old English inflicted on you. I would like to recall some lines that I think beautiful. I would say them firstly in English, and then in the stark and voweled Old English of the ninth century. It snowed from the north, rhyme bound the fields, hail fell on earth, the coldest of seeds, northern snude, rim rusan bond, hail feol on earthan, corna caldas. Now, going back to what I said about Homer, when the poet wrote that, he was merely recording things that had happened. This was, of course, very strange in the ninth century when people thought in terms of mythology, of allegorical images, and so on. He was merely telling very commonplace things. But nowadays, when we read, it snowed from the north, rhyme bound the fields, hail fell on earth, the coldest of seeds, there is an added poetry. There is the poetry of a, of a nameless Saxon having written those verses by the shores of the North Sea in Northumberland, I think, and of those verses coming to us so straightforward, so plain, and so pathetic throughout the centuries. So that we have both cases. There is the case, and it hardly dwell upon it, when time debases a poem, when the words lose their beauty. But there is also the case when time enriches and does not debase a poem. I have talked at the beginning about definitions. And to end up, I would like to say that we make a very common mistake when we think that we are ignorant of something because we are unable to define it. But if we are in a Chestertonian mood, and that is one of the best moods to be in, I think, then we might say that we can only define something when we know nothing whatever about it. For example, if I have to define poetry, then if I'm not, if I feel rather shaky about it, if I'm not too sure about it, then I say something like, poetry is the expression of the beautiful through the medium of words artfully woven together. And that definition may be good enough for a dictionary or for a textbook, but we all feel that it's rather feeble. At the same time, there is something far more important, something that may encourage us to go on, not only trying our hand at writing poetry, but enjoying it and feeling that we know all about it. And that is that we know what poetry is. We know it so well that we cannot define it in other words. 
even as we cannot define the taste of coffee, the color of red or of yellow, or the meaning of anger, of love, of hatred, of the sunrise, of the sunset, of our love for our country. Those things are so deep in us that they can only be expressed by those common symbols that we share. So why should we need other words? You may not agree with examples I have chosen. Perhaps tomorrow I may think of better examples. I may think I might have quoted other lines. But as you can pick and choose your own examples, it is not needful that you care greatly about Homer or about the Anglo-Saxon poets or about Rossetti, because everyone knows where to find poetry. And when it comes, he feels the touch of poetry. He feels that particular tingling of poetry. And to end with, I have a quotation from St. Augustine. And this comes in very fitly, I think. St. Augustine said, what is time? If people do not ask me what time is, I know. If they ask me what it is, then I do not know. And I feel in the same way about poetry, when it's hardly trouble about definitions. This time I have been rather at sea because I am no good at all at abstract thinking. But in our next lectures, if you're good enough to put up with me, then we will take more concrete examples. I will speak about the metaphor, about world music, about the possibility or impossibility of verse translation, about the telling of a tale, that is to say, about epic poetry, the oldest and perhaps the bravest kind of poetry. And then I will end with something that I can hardly divine now. I will end with a lecture called A Poet's Creed, wherein I will try to justify my own life and the confidence some of you may have on me, despite this rather awkward and fumbling first lecture of mine.